Well, I went to Copenhagen because, uh, you know, it's, it's the climate talks. I wanted to observe. I wanted to see if anything was going to happen. They had asked us for one of our pictures of our EVE project to go on the cube there. And I have a legal mechanism that we had worked up uh, for many other projects. An executive order is all it is, but it's for uh, fast-track permitting of carbon zero housing. And so I'm pushing for that. And so I thought maybe I could push a little there. And uh, I did have possible contacts with the European Union and I, actually, they contacted me. It's a, it's a, a you know, a heavily European city, uh, you know, a bunch of nice restaurants, fun, thick European uh, tradition in the air, uh, atmosphere of Europe, and it's, you know, it was nice. It was great. I had a meeting with a, a guy from the university, and he says, this looks good here in, in Copenhagen. It's a good city. It looks good on the outside. It's ready to crumble any any day within months on the inside. He said the the water system is polluted. The uh, their 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 entire water sources are getting polluted. Their ground is polluted. They said that uh, whenever they used to plow a field, the the birds would come and just swarm all around the plowing because of all the insects and worms and everything in the soil. Soil's dead now. When you plow a field, two birds come. I called a cab to go to the airport, and on the side it said, this is a carbon zero cab. So I asked the cab driver, how is this a carbon zero cab? I hear the gasoline engine running. And he says, oh, the company, the cab company, pays money to Africa. Uh, to me, you can't put a sign on a cab that says it's carbon zero unless that cab's running on grease or electricity from the sun. So that's, that's the way, and, and then Hillary Clinton was there talking. Uh, about some countries that uh, pollute a lot are paying countries that don't pollute. They're trying to solve the problem in terms of the very thing that created the problem. And <clears throat> it's just not radical enough. So I'm down to the point of saying when. When do we really start to see this as an emergency? If, if a levee's about to break and everybody's jumping in to throw, to, to stack up sandbags, do they with the levy just about to break, do they really sit down and have a meeting about what way to stack up the sandbags, uh, what kind of sandbags, uh, you know, uh, what is the, what is the uh, weight of the sandbags to make sure we don't injure people, uh, you know, that's what we're doing. And the levy's fucking breaking. What really happens when a levy is breaking and you can visually see the levy breaking, people start just immediately stacking up sandbags. They, you know, they may talk while they're doing it uh, about a better way to do it or something, or they may sing while they're doing it, they, but they start doing it. They start doing something. We're, we're standing here, all of the people, and the ground beneath us, for whatever reason, is turning into hot lava, and it's beginning to melt our shoes. And we're discussing which way is the most pertinent way to run while our feet are burning off. The, the main thing is run. The main thing is go away from where we are. Get away from where we are. It's not a matter of, of which direction to go. It's go away from where we are. Any direction would almost be better than where we are. That's the thing that I came away from there with. There was, I marched in a march. Oh, boy. There was a thousands and thousands of people with banners and, you know, wanting something to be done. If I took the money and the fossil fuel energy and the human energy of the Copenhagen talks and orchestrated it, I could have built a city that would have housed all the people that went to the conferences, you know, for the rest of their lives. What I saw in Copenhagen was a dinosaur of rhetoric and we need the stealth and the agility of a of a cougar to cruise through all of these issues relentlessly without any encumbrance of of dogma code regulation or whatever and i don't see any leader out there willing to do that i have a few contacts in leadership and i'm not going to mention names right now that are willing to take a few steps and we are going to jump on that the danger of doing carbon zero housing imperfectly is not near as severe 
as the danger of not doing it at all. We are in a somewhat flamboyant example of these six principles that we keep talking about, and they are uh, uh, building with recycled materials and powering with sun and wind and heating and cooling with solar thermodynamics and harvesting water from the sky and the snow melt and the rain and containing and treating your own sewage and producing a significant amount, if not all, of your own food. This building does all of those things. You know, you could walk through this building and find some imperfections on any one of these systems, but the point is, they work. They will take care of you. This building is aimed at taking care of four people, carbon zero, uh, without any fossil fuels being, being used. You can have a flat screen TV, you can have high speed internet. I mean, we've got carbon zero bananas here, as compared to huge carbon footprint bananas in the store from South America. We grow food here. We, we, you can go fishing here and catch a fish and gather vegetables and, and uh, uh, herbs from the gardens here and make it a meal. If I could have brought the Phoenix to the exhibit arena and had people walk through it, I could have, I could have rocked the place. This is action. This is activity. We, a bunch of us, are doing this, doing this in a community. We're stretching every limit of the law, pushing everything to be able to do this. We will talk while we're doing it, but we will not stop doing it. We will not stop. Yes, I want to do what we're doing. We're building buildings. We're finding pockets of freedom. We're struggling for permits. We're improving buildings. We have started a carbon zero subdivision. We are starting villages that are carbon zero. I, I dug in my heels much deeper because of Copenhagen. We took in the American Revolution 12-year-old kids and put rakes and shovels and hoes in their hands as weapons and said fight. People were brave back then. They saw the problem. The British were coming. Well now, the fire is coming. Global warming is coming. Polluted water is coming. Polluted air is coming. CO2 is coming. Plastic is floating in the oceans. I mean, it is time to put a rake in the hands of a 12-year-old and take a few risks. The best thing I can say that was said to me by an engineer that went through this building, he didn't say a word as I was explaining everything. Finally, when I got done, he said, what the world needs now is one billion of these immediately.